incredibly kind, and I'll stop blushing here in a minute. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Edwards and the Humanity Center uh, for the opportunity to, and, uh, to speak today and for all of the uh, great assistance in getting all this set up. Uh, and more importantly, for the promotion of the humanities over the years, as Dr. Edwards mentioned, I didn't realize I was quite so early in the uh, uh, having an involvement with this program, but uh, I've always been uh, uh, proud of the relationship that I've had with the humanities centers as a grad student and, uh, and currently. So, uh, you know, I, this will be my second brown bag, and I feel as though it's been entirely too long of an absence. <laughs> Uh, since the last one, uh, uh, you know, since that last one I had. I'd also like to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, this is a, uh, this work is very much in its early uh, stages. It's been something that I've been slowly working on for about a year. Uh, it's something that I'm going to be presenting on in May at the Rhetoric Society, Rhetorical Society of America conference. And, um, and then it's hopefully something that I'll be turning into a, a manuscript and then perhaps part of a larger book chapter or, or part of a, a larger book project that I plan to work on in the coming year. So I would appreciate any questions, any feedback, constructive um, or critical as I continue to shape this particular project. It is far from polished uh, as much as I would like and so I would be glad to hear any and all ideas that people have to offer. So thank you in advance. My interest in this project, uh, as Dr. Edwards notes, I did my dissertation and some other research um, about uh, Native American scholarship, and uh, I did not enter that saying I was going to be a Native American rhetoric scholar. Uh, that was actually, I had a list of questions that I was working with another project, and that project just did not work, and I found that the questions were better answered looking at an issue of all things that I was researching for debate and my lives completely connected. Um, and then I always said, well, I'm not going to be a Native American scholar or indigenous First Nation scholar. I'm going to move away from this to the next project. And then I found myself coming back doing a study about a museum controversy uh, at U of M related to their uh, indigenous dioramas uh, that they, that they uh, uh, put away and, uh, and quit uh, displaying. Then I said I wasn't going to come back to it, and yet, yet here I am. <laughs> but what brought me to this was something a little tad bit different. Uh, the, in the wake of the shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, some really interesting forms of protest began in the NFL, or signs, I'm not sure it's protest as much as signs of solidarity, but no, most notable was when uh, the players from the local team in Missouri, the St. Louis Rams, came out onto the field holding their hands up, and the hands up don't shoot. Uh, solid, uh, as a sign of solidarity with the protesters in Ferguson. It was originally the NFL tried to quash that behavior and then the NFL actually began to embrace it. Uh, in the wake of that then we have this image which I just found rather fascinating that we have players in solidarity against uh, anti-black rhetoric and behavior yet on the very hands that they're holding up is what many consider to be a racial slur and a, and a hateful image. And so it's seen this image that really made me think a lot about the uh, Washington team's mascot, which I had been slowly thinking about over the years. Uh, but really around this time, 2013, 2014, a lot of things began happening uh, with the NFL in relation to uh, racial slurs on the field uh, in a debate about the appropriateness of this particular mascot. Uh, and this particular mascot has been protested for about 40 years at this point. Uh, it has started from a street level protest in outside the stadium and through various uh, stages going up to Congress. Even uh, President Obama made a statement regarding the mascot. Uh, and it is far from being resolved. So 2013-14, as I mentioned, was a pivotal point uh, in this debate. The first was that the uh, Fritz Pollard Alliance, uh, which is an alliance, uh, is a nonprofit group who promotes diversity and equality in NFL hiring, uh, named, and it was then the groups named after the first black NFL head coach called on the NFL to prohibit the use of the N-word by players and personnel because it was a disgraceful slur. 
and then the action was taken on that. 2014 Ferguson protest in response to the shooting death of Michael Brown, as I just showed on the previous image. This brings a certain level of race consciousness onto the playing field. And then Congress calls on the Washington owner to change the mascot and logo, and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office cancels the team's trademark registration because the name is disparaging. Now, just recently, there's been uh, one court upheld that decision. There's been a ruling on a separate matter that says that disparaging remark or disparaging nature cannot be the basis in which a trademark protection is removed. So they're probably going to get this trademark protection back. Uh, but what was also interesting at this time is the concern about the use of the N-word on the field again intersects with the Washington team. The, the, what sparked uh, a lot of this discussion was that Trent Williams, a player on the uh, Washington team, was accused of referring of, of calling a referee by that term. And so again, as I was beginning to look into this, all of these worlds kept colliding together. Um, uh, and continue to stir my interest. And so what happens as a result of this during this time? Well, the NFL does act. Uh, but despite the convergence of concerns, uh, the NFL on a number of front, uh, they argue that the, the N-word should be regulated. Okay? But ultimately, the uh, NFL Competition Committee announces that they already have existing policy that covers this and it becomes a 15-yard penalty, a uh, possibility of a fine and perhaps ejection from the field depending on severity. Uh, and so that is decided that this one use of language on the field inappropriate. What's interesting in this, uh, the pictures here is up front is, uh, is Jeff Fisher who is the coach of the Rams at the time. Uh, he is a member of the NFL competition committee who made the decision on whether or not they're going to make new policy on this. And then the uh, Atlanta's uh, owner is in the background, uh, McKay, I think is his name. I'm, I'm blanking. Mike McKay, perhaps. They're both on the commission. Over here is Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL. On the mascot issue, though, right around the same time, Goodell comes out and actually publicly defends the name. Not simply just taking a stance of this is not our decision, this is an ownership issue. They come out and he comes out and strongly defends the name as an essential part of the legacy of the fans and the organization. Okay, which stunned me that he would come out as forcefully as he does to respond to a congressional inquiry. Uh, and so what, what motivated the project that I'm talking about today then is this contradictory behavior. How is it? Uh, that the NFL can act so forcefully in one instance and not understand that the same logic should probably apply to one of its own one of its own organizations and its own institutional behavior. So why care? First is that Native American mascots are a pervasive, ubiquitous feature of American culture. They are everywhere. Despite our attempts to regulate uh, to seek permission to use mascots, uh, they continue to be everywhere. Okay, there are colleges, high schools, uh, earlier education, professional level, okay, and that, uh, and even here at Wayne State, where we moved away from the Tartar mascot, we became a vaguely defined warrior, which is one of the is also a term that is often protested uh, as a uh, as a problematic representation of indigenous culture. Uh, and perhaps the fact that we have a Matt Anthony Wayne Day and we have Anthony Wayne Drive in Wayne County is also kind of problematic uh, for a number of folks. Second of all is that American, ma the, the indigenous mascots are not simply an Indian issue. They matter to all of us uh, because they become a, a critical public element of the colonial legacy. Uh, and as I'll talk about today, a lot of the colonial logic of appropriation uh, and displacement very much operates through mascots. Uh, and this is an incredibly complex issue. As Dr. Edwards mentioned, I'm fascinated by public debate and the complexities of those debates, and this is a prime example. I mean, you have various leaders of different communities that have come forward and said, we support the use of these mascots. There are large segments of the population that say they are against them. 
public attitudes are divided, uh, and there is just a, a great deal of complexity dealing with the issue. So I sort of want to footnote that uh, because at times my, my presentation today can't quite dive into the complexity that's present here, uh, but it's certainly an important issue beyond just those interested in sports or those that are affected within the communities. Now I'm not going to go into a lot of the effects of mascots that's been talked about in our literature, but there is a, on the political front, a number of people have come out and said this is a disrespectful term and image, uh, and that it's one that should be replaced. Uh, and both communication scholars and sociologists, particularly sports sociologists, have done a lot of research on the effects of mascots and their use by various communities. Uh, Jason Edward Splack in the Communication Studies has done the study of mascotting as a hegemonic strategy that separates American Indians from their cultural heritage. Once that severance occurs, nationalism fills in uh, to then define what Native American means, how it shall exist, and where it shall be relocated through a rhetoric of the mascot. Black also further describes naming and um, Mascots is dehumanizing, the naming and misrepresenting of indigenous identity comes to define and on an ontological level inhibit what it means to be native. So it's not simply that a legacy or a certain image or a value becomes appropriated uh, with a mascot, but it's very much an important step to then replace and say, well, isn't it a shame that this culture has disappeared? Fortunately, we've reclaimed it as a legacy in tribute of those people. Whether those people are still alive or not, ontologically they become replaced within this discourse. My argument for today is that I'm interested in the logic that uh, argues that the, uh, that, uh, that the desire to so strongly be attached to this um, mascot through the NFL and the Washington ownership as a, as a result of the rhetorical framing that overemphasizes A, individual rather than institutional acts of racism, and B, individual utterances directed at present players rather than the systemic use of discourse to frame an entire population as socially invisible or ontologically dead. And, and just to be clear, I'm not the only person that's noted the, the contradiction that exists in NFL policy. A number of sports writers uh, such as Michael Wilbon has come out rather forcefully to say it's ridiculous that the NFL acted on this one term and has not acted uh, against the Washington mascot. However, my goal here is to understand how that happens. Not necessarily just to point out the contradiction, but to understand what allows that to happen, because it doesn't make a lot of sense. The texts that I examine for this project are four. Uh, the one is the Fritz Pollard Alliance letter for, uh, for the former, current, and, pa and future players, as the authors wrote, that came out in 2013. It is a statement and a press release that says that the use of the N-word uh, should be eradicated from the NFL. Uh, the NFL Competition Committee uh, annual press conference in 2014 that discussed the potential change in policy uh, regarding the use of racial slurs. Then I looked at the Washington owner Dan Snyder's letter to fans that was printed in the Washington Post in 2013 that comes out as a ownership defense of their use of the mascot. And this comes in response to congressional inquiries uh, and discussion and uh, committees uh, talking about the issue. And then finally, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell's 2013 letter to Congressman Cole and Congresswoman McCollum, the co-chairs of the Congressional Native American Caucus. Uh, in which Goodell very strongly defends the use of the mascot and the logo. Uh, and in looking at these texts, I explore these four texts to understand how they symbolically frame and use and affect uh, racial discourses. In doing so, I argued that the contradictory approaches used by the NFL uh, reveal how the NFL and Washington ownership use a colonial logic to ontologically displace Native people in history appropriate inaccurate and insensitive representations of First Nation people, but also construct a romanticized legacy of Euro-American respect for indigenous people. To do this, I use the following method and theoretical assumptions. Uh, the method that I'm going to be using is uh, from uh, noted uh, scholar Kenneth Burke, 
and his notion of dramatic framing in the, in the uh, in Pentad. Uh, frame analysis is something that's been used by both communication scholars and media effects scholars for a number of years. Uh, in that the idea being that for rhetorical or discursive frames are a process of selecting uh, and also ignoring elements of a particular story. So it operates like a frame or as a camera lens that you look on something and that frame becomes what we focus on, but we ignore what's not immediately in the frame. Uh, Burke uh, also theorized about frames, although he uses the term terministic screen. For Burke, language operates as a terministic screen because it's not only affects the nature of our observations, but also directs our attention from one place to the other. Rather than simply being a reflection of reality, Burke insists that language operates as the selection and the deflection of reality slow on my uh, uh, trigger here, but a selection and deflection of reality. Uh, Mary Stuckey and John Murphy, also of the communication field, uh, also have an interesting argument about how naming operates very much as a frame, particularly within indigenous communities and discussions, that names order our world and direct our attention, and that the paradoxical uh, constitutive power of the core of the colonial enterprise is the power to name. It's paradoxical because in our attempt to define accurately a situation, it's inherently selective and inaccurate. Now for Burke, he viewed human communication through the metaphor of drama. Specifically, he maintained that there are two types of, uh, of dramatic frames. There is the tragic and the comedic frames. Uh, for tragedy, the most common yet harmful frame Tragic frames tend to inflate the importance of people, acts, and events to the points of absolute. So we have heroes, villains, sacrifice, victimage, and everything goes to extremes of importance. It often leads to violence because once we create the perfect enemy, the only option left is generally to destroy or to, uh, or to be, paint ourselves as a victim, and it limits reflection and critical understanding of important public matters. And that's the most common frame. Burke offers the, the comedic frame as a corrective to tragedy. And it's not funny, ha-ha comedy, but instead, like the, the theatrical or literary genre, is that comedy emphasizes humility, reflectiveness, and optimism about the human condition. Now, I wish we were largely looking at the comedic frame today, but unfortunately, we will be looking at the dramatic frame, which is the most common. For Burke's method of he developed a pentad of terms that one can use to analyze uh, the development of drama uh, and dramatic framing. So by identifying the terms that are in interaction within a text or series of texts, a critic will identify the central, dominant, and controlling terms. The terms reveal the writer's ideologies and worldview. There's act, which is human, any human action. Scene, which is the context that bears on action. The agent, which is the people that perform the act. Agency, which is the means or vehicle through which action is performed. And then lastly, purpose, which is the, that explicitly names the motives of given agents. So I use these five terms and read the four texts that I had previously described. And in my analysis, I define the terms in this way. So I'm reading the four texts, two dealing with the N-word, two dealing with the R-word. And the agents are defined as the players, fans, and officials. They become the central players within this drama. The act is unsportsmanlike conduct, either on the field between players and officials, or unsportsmanlike conduct as an organization, although that is very rarely discussed. Agency is the use of racist language or racial slurs. The scene is the playing field and the legacy of fans and key coaches and players. And finally, the purpose is to preserve the legacy of the NFL. And that's a debated legacy. But those are the way that the terms become defined. And I was a tad shocked that I thought that something like agency, the use of language itself, would be one of the dominant terms. Because for Burke, he says that when you define these terms, one will become the featured term that reveals the ideology and mindset of the rhetors. Uh, but what I found was that agent is really the controlling term within these documents that uh, the agent controls, for instance, the scene is entirely about individuals' presence on the field and individual fans and their reactions. 
The act on sportsmanlike conduct is entirely about individual players' acts and not institutional actions. So what we focus on is entirely what happens within the building itself, not what is in the stands on the fans' clothing, what's outside the building, what's in the advertisements. Agency, the racist language itself, only matters when directed at individuals presented, present on the field. And the only penalties discussed at all would be for individuals uttering these statements. And lastly, the purpose. The legacy of the NFL is regulating, controlled by individuals, regulating other individuals. Institutional behavior of any kind is not mentioned or discussed within these texts. Now, some examples of this. Um, Jeff Fisher, for instance, from the NFL Competition Committee, notes that we agree that we have an issue on the field. We agree that we're going to get on this and get it under control as soon as possible we can. We are going to clean up the game on the field between the players. So here is where you see the emphasis on the behavior of individual players uh, and that the legacy of the game will be controlled by how well they can control the players playing the game. Okay? Not, for instance, NFL owners who perhaps have multiple DUIs, ownerships that have had made numerous embarrassing statements publicly, Solely the legacy of the NFL has been impacted by these players. Wooten and Car Car uh, Carson, excuse me, from the Fritz Polar Alliance, as former players who have worked hard in different eras of the game to leave proud legacies for those who follow us, we are appalled and extremely disappointed to learn that the worst and most derogatory word ever spoken in our country is being used during these games as well as casually in the locker room. So with John Wooten and Harry Carson, uh, former players are concerned about the behavior of current players because it affects the legacy that they helped to build in the NFL. Again, Wooten and Carson, we cannot condone on any level the use of the N-word. We understand that the history of the game and especially the significance of the reintegration of the NFL in 1946, when, when many who opposed blacks playing on the field used the same racial epithet uh, from the stands. Men like uh, Washington, Strode, Willis, and Motley bravely withstood the indignity of the N-word during these times when black men were beaten and even hung to use it now as a disgrace. So here, again, the concern is about the impact that it has upon agents. That the, it's not that there is a broader NFL legacy, it's that the legacy of the NFL is to pay tribute to previous players. And that using these terminology language in today's game is a disgrace to those players who had to face that particular term during that time in different social contexts. I'll skip past this one. Dan Snyder. Like so many of you, I was born a fan of the Washington team. I still remember my first game, that tradition, the song, the cheers. It mattered so much to me when I was a child, and I know it matters to every other Washington fan in the D.C. area and across the nation. Our past isn't just where we came from, it's who we are. Now, and turning to the Redskin issue here, I, I find it really fascinating uh, that in this debate, and Snyder's comment is a perfect example of it, that again, the focus is on the impact on individual fans. That individual fans, that there is a legacy of joy, excitement, the theme song of the organization, the ability to put on a shirt with the mascot, or what define the legacy of being a fan of that particular organization. And so the argument being that we cannot take this legacy away from those individuals. And that it would be unfair uh, to respect people outside of the game uh, to, to apparently disservice those that come to the game. Another comment from Snyder uh, in his editorial in the Washington Post, but we cannot ignore our 81 year history or the strong feelings of most of our fans as well as Native Americans throughout the country. This might be the, one of the only times Dan Snyder mentions that. After 81 years, the team name Redskins continues and hold the memories and meanings of where we came from, who we are, and who we want to be in the years to come. We are the Redskin Nation, and we owe it to our fans and coaches and players, past and present, to preserve that heritage. So another example about the, the name is about us, the fans, about the players, even individual owners, and their legacy as members of the organization. Uh, it's not the legacy of the First Nation people, although Snyder makes a reference to that, uh, but within the larger letter, there is not a very coherent argument as to why this perhaps paints a better legacy 
um, uh, for the Native people. Now, I do want to sort of take an aside for a minute to mention, to return to a point I made earlier about the debate about mascots within First Nation uh, communities. Is that uh, it is a complex issue because uh, what I have found in the literature, there seems to be kind of three different perspectives on the issue. One is kind of an undefined, yeah, we're fine with the term, it doesn't really bother us. Okay? There's not a lot of sort of explanation other than that. There's a second opinion that we don't care about the mascot issue because there are far more pressing matters that deserve our attention and we are wasting our effort combating this one. Okay? And there's a lot to criticize about that particular perspective probably, uh, but it's one that's frequently expressed. The last opinion, I think, is the really interesting one, and one that I studied previously in a piece about museums, is a fear of cultural erasure, that if, while these representations are not the best and they are not accurate, uh, that if we eliminate every single representation that is considered disrespectful or inaccurate, that we won't have any representation. Uh, and that is expressed quite frequently in a number of these debates by people, uh, you know, that I think is a fairly interesting perspective uh, and one that makes us have to think carefully about the idea of let's just replace the mascot, you know, or let's just change consumer behavior. Uh, because there are real concerns. I think it's, it's a uh, problematic position to be forced into, hey, we've been assimilated so far. Uh, and ontologically defined in such a way that, uh, you know, mascots are the only thing that might publicly represent us in ways. Uh, but, you know, it's a legitimate fear that's advanced within these communities. Uh, and Snyder's comments feed on some of these sentiments. Now the next example is by Roger Goodell. And in our view, a fair and thorough discussion of the issue must begin with an understanding of the roots of the Washington franchise and the Redskin name in particular. The team began as the Boston Braves in the 1930, uh, 1932, a name that honored the courage and heritage of Native Americans. Yeah. Um, probably that name came about more due to revolutionary action that happened in Boston, but we'll take his word at, at, at its face value, I guess. They, uh, the, the following year, the name was changed to the Redskins, in part to avoid confusion about the Boston baseball team of the same name, but also to honor the team's then head coach, William Lone Star Dietz, uh, neither an intent nor use of the name has ever been meant to denigrate Native Americans or offend such a group. Now, the, the use of the, of the mascot to honor an early coach or an early player is a typical trope within these mascot debates. Okay? There is always some sort of fictitious origin story that rationalizes the use of these mascots. It is a common rhetoric that I'm going to study in my larger book project along with the idea that we can get permission from these, that it's even appropriate to ask permission to use representations of other people. Uh, but uh, Goodell points out the real reason to the name here already. It was an economic marketing reason. Is that there, you had two teams, one in baseball, one in football, the exact same name, it was confusing, right? So it probably cut down sales because you buy one shirt and you represent both teams. Uh, so they changed the name a year later. Uh, but you know, Dietz uh, is a highly controversial figure. He was not indigenous at all. He was born from two white parents. They might have had some very remote uh, indigenous heritage uh, and lineage, but uh, he claimed this status so that he could avoid the draft. Uh, and he was arrested later for doing this. Okay? But it's amazing that today, despite this known fact, we can, the ownership continues this bogus legacy of the name of the organization. Okay? It was not to tribute, the, it's in tribute to this person, and there is a lengthy uh, uh, exposés that, that rip this rationale apart. But the NFL and even the NFL commissioner continues this. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if this is Snyder's argument, but it's really stunning when Roger Goodell comes out and uses this as a as a defense of this particular name. Uh, and so the, you know, what's, what's interesting here though is with Goodell's statement is that the, the tribute of an individual is the real purpose. So again, we're returning to the dramatic frame that here is this hero, this legacy of the organization that is really the reason that we need to have this name. It would be disrespectful to Dietz 
to come back and say, no, 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 we're no longer the Redskins. And there's also within their origin story that the original team had four uh, Native American players, along with Dietz as coach, and so this is a tribute to those five individuals. Uh, but again, the focus is, the frame itself is focused on the individual. Uh, the concerns about institutional acts of racism are non-existent. This is because the frame also focuses attention on the playing field and the presence of players there. Simply put, the majority of players in the NFL, past and present, are black, and their behavior and treatment is a constant concern of the NFL, as it should be. Makes sense. The problem, however, on the other hand, is there's very few indigenous players in the NFL currently or in the past, and that the First Nations' largest impact on the NFL is largely off the field, through protest and uh, by, by getting congressional attention and political attention to the issue. So while there is pressure, it's not affecting the product on the field. And it can be easily removed and separated as an issue of concern. Uh, and as I mentioned, this also highlights the, the importance of physical presence. If those players were there on the field and saying this is bothersome or coaches or officials, I think you would see more action on this particular issue. Uh, but when they are made visible, it's in the discourse of Snyder where he points to a handful of individual First Nation leaders who he claims supports the use of the mascot. So again, it's not about communities or institutions. It's here's a handful of people I found that happen to like the mascot. We're free to use it. So conclusions. First is that the dramatic framing uh, that exaggerates the importance of individuals and their legacy and what it selects are foregrounds, first of all, is a focus on the presence of players on the field and their community and how they're affected by racial slurs. That individual utterances directed at players and the punishment of individuals. And that individuals' experiences and memories are tied to a mascot and that the exaggerated value of that experience and identity. What is deflected by this frame is the institutional behavior and discourses. It's not considered a slur because it's not directed at individual people. In fact, we have individuals who say it's fine, it's not a slur. Thus, we can appropriate it as a legacy for the fans, and for individual fans in particular. This dramatic emphasis on the agent overemphasizes the importance of physical presence on the field, the players, or in the stadium, which are the fans, which renders the Native American people as socially invisible at best, we're socially dead or ontologically dead at worst. Isn't it a shame we lost our Native American communities? Thank goodness we have this legacy to remember them by. Let's go football. Okay. And then the colonial appropriation of indigenous values and legacy as a justification or purpose for the use of racist discourse. And I think this explains why the NFL can act so strangely and so strongly against the one symbol and not with the other. If the native subject is no longer exist or has little presence in the game, it can become a symbolic fill-in for a Euro-American legacy about sports and group identity. Uh, Deloria has a great book that goes that makes an argument about how Euro-American identity has always been incomplete because when we founded this country, our identity was we're not British. But that's not a sufficient ground to ground an identity, and so we had to create a positive identity and our source material was indigenous values, images, traditions. Uh, and so this is just yet another colonial act of appropriating legacy as a way to fill in group and, uh, and sports kind of community behavior. Uh, and I argue this goes beyond sports. We were kind of joking around before the presentation that, you know, we don't care about sports somewhat or things like that. But, I mean, this still impacts people. My wife doesn't watch really any professional sports with any interest. Uh, she does claim to bleed Honolulu blue and silver, but uh, I don't think she's seen a game in three years. Yeah, I thought you'd appreciate that. Um, you know, but she has shirts. You know, I mean, she has the apparel because living in this town or being from the Chicago area, you have to have a Blackhawk jersey. You know, that it's part of your identification with that area. So all of these things affect us in some way. Uh, and that it's very hard to escape. What I also think that's interesting from a communication perspective as my last conclusion is that it creates a contradiction in the understanding of language. And that in one instance, the N-word is unredeemable term that causes great harm. I'm not disagreeing with that assessment at all. I mean, there's some communication theory that I operate that, that 
would offer some different sort of arguments and ways that we should deal with the word, but that's fine. But it, it's odd that in the same in the same sort of time period and almost the exact same people say that the R word is a redeemable term that can be appropriated for a colonial group identity that is respectful rather than harmful. Uh, and so these are competing interpretations about whether or not appropriation of language can operate and how full or empty discourse operates. And I say the difference between them is ontological status of the subjects affected. You know, that it is easy to say if the N-word, it's irredeemable because, uh, particularly in the context of the NFL, there are black players, there are black referees, there are black fans everywhere. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, that the problem is if we've already erased the indigenous figure or not focusing on them within the frame, then it becomes very easy to say, oh, well, there's no one here to worry about the term. We'll take it. And so that is uh, the conclusions that I have so far for this particular project. And as I mentioned, I am continuing to work on it. Uh, and so I'd be happy to answer any sort of questions or to, uh, to field any sort of feedback that you might have. But most of all, thank you very much uh, for your attention and for being here today. I really appreciate it. Like I said, I have had uh, research presentations where the only people present were the other panelists. So this is really <laughs> awesome on a Wednesday. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, not in this, but uh, yeah, you can't really ignore them uh, in any discussion of mascots. Yeah, but no, they are, um, uh, you know, as I always say to people, uh, that they, I lived in Cleveland for a little while, uh, and I have uh, grad students from Cleveland uh, that's a big fan, and the, what actually got me probably initially interested in all of this was that I went to, uh, at the time, Jacobs Field, I forget what they call it now, and uh, across the street, or maybe it's not across the street, but a nearby community there is a communist bookstore that I just had to walk into to see. Uh, and it is the site, uh, it's really the, sort of the home base of protests uh, against the mascot. And I just casually asked about the issue. And I think like two hours later, I walked out of the bookstore with a pile of literature. Uh, you know, uh, and it really made me think like, you know, in, in Cleveland, they sell a lot of uh, clothing that does not feature uh, Chief Wahoo, you know, in this instance, it's not necessarily the name that's the problem, but it's certainly the mascot is just horrible depiction. Just they've terrible. made a shift to using the C. Yeah, they've shifted to yeah. a C to kind of do that as well. But, you know, it, the residue remains, right? I mean, no matter what shift they make, it's remembered, and that, that imagery still exists. You know, it's an also interesting recent example of this is Eastern Michigan. You know, when they changed their mascot from Hurons uh, to Eagles, that the band recently started wearing the, like a, a throwback jacket with an old mascot on it, I think on the inside of the, of the jacket. And the NCA had to come back and say, no, 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 you don't, no. Okay. Uh, you know, and the other problem with some of these issues too is like there's always throwback jerseys or there's like kind of an underground circuit for mascots and things like that where they have some value. But the Cleveland one is you know, really fascinating, not only based on the, the, the protests that happen, uh, but they also have a similar, like, uh, everything that's happening here is a similar uh, trope. That's why I want to study it as a book, because it's like almost a playbook. Oh, we have a legacy. There was a, you know, there was a, an indigenous player that the name originally came to represent. And so, and then we asked permission from a number of communities and individuals, and they all said, yes, this is fine. So we have that, and the appropriation of the values of indigenous communities become the reason that we have a legacy in this city with that name. Uh, you know, so it's a very similar sort of playbook. I just wanted to say with respect to the Cleveland issue, like the team's owner, I can't even remember his name right now, um, he pretty staunchly asserted just last year that even that this C was providing fans with another option, but that they weren't removing right. Wahoo. Oh, okay. So they're still yeah. manufacturing the Wahoo yeah. logo. Yeah. I feel like I've looked at that issue since like 2004 or 2005, and I feel like they are making that move, but they're hiding it from their fans, you know? Right, <laughs> like sure, they actually sure. just want to act like they're the still the protecting Wahoo. Yeah, yeah. the Wahoo image. Well, they fear the backlash to it, right? I mean, right. there's a ton of, you know, there's very passionate attachments to these mascots. And as I talk about, there's a, 
a discursive explanation for that is because it becomes, once it becomes appropriated, it fills in as part of the community identity, mm -hmm. right? And so the, uh, to remove it creates really passionate responses and resentment. I have very progressive friend, friends from uh, North Dakota uh, and I went to North Dakota State University. And right now the NCA, uh, various courts, the governor, uh, alumni have been fighting a huge battle for years back and forth on the use of the fighting Sioux for their mascot logo. And my friends who normally are pretty progressive about a wide range of issues are, are, are incredibly upset about the idea of changing this mascot. And it just makes no sense to me, given their statements and sort of values and other issues. So it really speaks to some sort of core identity. You know, being a Ball State member, if they change the Cardinal to the Tiger Lily tomorrow, I wouldn't really care that much. But, you know, when it becomes a, a sort of like community value that then also these origin stories talk about how it's the values of the, the history of the land and things like that, then it gets so incredibly messy. Yeah. Could there be a generational shift in, in the way you, that, that, that were meant to provide what were once respected terms or, mm -hmm. uh, or images or ideas mm -hmm. and then a whole other shift? Mm -hmm. And that generational change uh, is just today rather shocking. I mean, it's like I was thinking, if you were thinking, I was thinking. You know, Uncle Ben's rights, or mm -hmm. or, sure. or 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 you know, these kind of images were, were, were once taken as kind of the, you know, we go back to the thirties and the forties, and you, you go like, you know, now today it's kind of like it looks kind of like what's that all about? Sure. So I kind of wonder if that may be generational shift mm -hmm. as well as people are more aware of the racial, racialized tropes that they are. Sure, sure. Well, certainly when we're talking about the N-word, uh, there's several generational aspects, right? I mean, the, uh, the part that I don't talk about here uh, that I would like to dive into at some point, I just don't know it's this project, but another one is, you know, that Richard Sherman of the Seattle uh, Seahawks came out pretty strongly in defense of players' use of the word uh, in that it's an appropriation argument that there's like a... Uh, use between black players is appropriate. You know, I mean, there's a huge debate about that. But it is often defined by generational differences. That the, the, uh, the polar group is old, much older generation of players, black players, and their opinion is fairly strong in the use of the word. And then the younger players uh, are rather upset with that generation about this debate about the term. Um, but you know, as I mentioned, what's, what's interesting about the indigenous images and representations though is like that we don't see large shifts in generations I mean the uh, the the Cleveland one is sort of interesting that there is like a, a markets developed that you don't see in Washington uh, that you don't see in other instances for whatever reason heck there's entire generations that don't really understand the backstory of Scott's Jersey with the, the, the Black Hawk mascot it's not nearly as as a troubled background, but it's, a, it's an artificial creation. There are no Black Hawks. Uh, there was Black Hawk, who was a, uh, a, an indigenous fighter who fought against the U.S. in the 1812 war. When they finally captured him, they dragged him around to every military base to embarrass and, and dehumanize him. Then we started naming helicopters after him. You know, then that became the name of the organization, uh, that you don't see those generational shifts with these types of mascots. And I, again, my argument is, goes back to the ontological framing, you know, of these, of the people affected, is they're not present. You know, there's no, there, while there are protests, it's easy to dismiss it because, you know, they're not present in the stands, they're not on the field, they have no real way to disrupt uh, the nature of the game. And so, uh, you know, I would like to see changes, and I think there must be something, there's something going on, I mean, with your point, that we had this, again, another, another moment of real critical interrogation about this in 2013, 14, and beyond, that just sort of, you know, exploded. Uh, and so I'm interested to see, I, I really don't know what, you know, I offer a kind of an explanation of how this convergence of interest happened, um, you know, but I'm interested to see if these sort of discussions keep happening. Because I think the only way to really, uh, I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll stop it in one second. The, uh, I think the only way to really combat these mascots appropriately, though, as I will argue in 
later publications, though, is to challenge the colonial logic that says it's appropriate to seek either permission, that we can claim a legacy that's not our own, rather than just getting rid of the mascots. You know, I, I just don't think a full frontal sort of challenge uh, leads to much. And as we saw with the patent office, you know, they, it was a victory. Everyone was so excited, and then it just disappeared instantly. Uh, you know, so I think there needs to be, of course, as a critical scholar, I'm going to say we need more, more discussion, more critical interrogation, but I think that's got to get exposed more so that you don't have things like progressive people supporting the fighting suit and things like that. Um, I guess I'm sort of interested in the, the dichotomy, maybe it's a false dichotomy, of a similar thing that's happening around the same time as this conversation is happening, which is the institutional ban of... Um, the use of, say, the Confederate flag oh, on public sure. buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and that was an issue where there are still individuals who identify very strongly with that particular legacy. Mm -hmm. And so it's a similar issue, but the success occurs on an institutional level. Yeah. And the backlash is on, the, is on an individual level, which mm -hmm. makes me wonder if there's a, a connection or a, a representation or a mirroring of sort of what's happening in the NFL at this point, where the institution is defending um, the terminology and the usage, as opposed to individuals who, uh, some of whom are ready to sort of give that up. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we see the institution sort of cracking in the pressure of it. You know, I mean, again, it becomes, you know, unfortunately what caused that to crack, you know, is just the, just the amount, the absurd amount of anti-black violence. You know, I mean, that's, you know, and then this sort of this acceptance in our society recently of just, you know, sort of with the public, the, the decline in public discourse, in my opinion, of where we're just allowed to say whatever, you know, just saying sort of mentality. Oh, I have a random terrible thought. Let me express it. Yay, Trump. You know, the, <laughs> um, you know and down with political correctness. I get to say whatever I think. And that, you know, that I... I think those are related sort of trends of this just sort of this racialized, uh, um, you know, anxiety about a number of issues uh, that it just allows overt anti-black discourse and violence to be happening. That I think is what sparked that, right? That uh, led to uh, uh, this one symbol. Yeah, you know, I don't think that that did. Uh, well, I, mean, I think that was an important step, un unquestionably an important step. But uh, you know, that's one that also, though, while the Governments have taken down the display of it and overt uh, support of it. You know, as you mentioned, it's the individuals where I still see them. You know, as I as I'm constantly confused living in the Midwest, I see them all over the place. In the North Midwest. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, we were the Northern aggressors. I don't understand why we celebrate that tradition. I mean, I don't know why anyone would, but it's very odd to me. Kelly, a couple things. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the idea of the appropriation of the you know, sort of colonialist move that's here. And um, and I've heard other people make that argument, incidentally. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. Ward Churchill argued that uh, when I saw him actually at Miami, which mm -hmm. uh, used to be known as the Redskins, right, now the Red Hawks, yeah. um, is uh, he argued that the that the taking of the of the logo and the taking of the image was essentially uh, the right of the conquest. Mm -hmm. um, that they could do that and get away with it because we won. Yeah, right, because the, yeah. the the force is to be enough. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering about the idea that this is inherently something that's tied to mascots, or if it's specifically tied to mascots associated with the Native Americans. And I mean, I'm thinking of mascots like I don't know the Celtics or the Hoosiers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which have you know all sorts of uh, racist and uh, uh, and or classist implications, mm -hmm. um, but don't get any kind of, of or, or backlash. Yeah, sure. Um, of course, in the Hoosiers case, part it's because nobody really nobody knows what a Hoosier is. is. <laughs> right. uh, but the the emblem for the Hoosiers back in the the 50s was um, this guy that had you know barefoot um, and and you know torn jeans kind sure, of thing and, sure. and big uh, you know sprig of uh, grass hanging out of sure. his mouth. Right. right. So like a very the, clearly classic. The, the Missouri right redneck mm -hmm. is what exactly. a Hoosier is in Missouri. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So is is there a difference because it's a Native American issue, or, or does this is this is it also extend to say the fighting Irishman? Right. Mm -hmm. It's about who has the power, right? Who's controlling the means of production? Yeah. I mean, I think that gets that gets right to the heart of the question. Is that yeah? It's most certainly a difference in the in the culture of it. That um, uh, you know that the uh, 
you know, much of the sentiment that Churchill has is expressed by some of the other scholars that I mentioned here. But yeah, I think that it's um, uh, in those instances that it, uh, I mean, they're not really appropriating that tradition perhaps as much as reflecting somewhat. I mean, there is classist implications like the Hoosier, right? But I mean, you know, growing up in Indiana, you spend a substantial amount of time in Indiana that the, you know, that the sort of, you know, the agricultural rural aspect of Indiana defines us. Well, and we have other people from Indiana here too. The, um, you know, that, uh, you know, I don't think there would be that much opposition to it. Maybe people in Carmel. Uh, you know, but, and then, uh, you know, with the fighting Irish as well, or the Celtics, you know, things like that, that while there is some discussion of that occasionally, you know, that it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't register for those communities. So I think it is simply a power, uh, a power operation. And that, you know, saying if you took Hoosier from me, I don't feel as though my identity changes, right? I mean, I don't think that you're taking some legacy from me uh, and redirecting it, right? Which is completely the colonial move with the Native American mascots. You know, which is not simply just a let's reflect your culture here, but we are taking it, completely redefining it, usually with a fake origin story, fake heroes that are over, you know, exaggerated. And saying this is the legacy for our fans, you know. I'm sorry. Oh. Well, I just tried sort of a, a, the second part of it was the, the issue of the images, um, which you didn't talk about too extensively here, but I know it's part of the controversy is you know what um, you know what the images are that are being appropriated and, and how you know the the characterization as the warrior, right, as the mm -hmm. savage and yeah. so forth, yeah. um, and is is it, it you know would the debate change? Substantially, if the Redskins or the Fighting Sioux or someone were to say, you know what, the, you're right about the image issue, right? We, we need to change that. Mm -hmm. Does that, I mean, do you think that would make a substantial difference or is it all one package? You know, I, I, I think it's combined. I mean, in this instance, nobody really, I, there's, not that I'm aware of, substantial debate about the image itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, they're really a, a total package. Whereas I've seen discussion with Cleveland Indians that, Chief Wahoo is, you know, just an absurd caricature, and that if that were separated, it might be okay. Although that, I mean, that that doesn't really resolve the issue either. I mean, you know, and so the uh, and even like I said, Wayne State Warriors. I mean, you often see a list of contested terms and warriors is often last, not simply because it's alphabetical, but it's one that doesn't kind of receive the attention that you know some of the other fights have. So no, I don't think they could be easily. Uh, change that way and I think it would just lead to as I said that's there's still it would lead to the exact same attachment like you take away the symbol it's still there though right and so the you know the fight would continue you know just like I said if you changed everything if you change the symbol the name that doesn't change the association you know walk around this campus and ask people about tartar and stuff you know I mean I think there's still a number of people that are don't realize we changed mascots I mean, that might be because we don't have a ton of disability of a mascot, but, uh, you know, I mean, I'm guilty of it. I was a tartar when I first came here, and I'm always kind of a tartar, so. Jay? Um, I wondered if you could speak to the, the appropriation of the performances that happen at these sports games, oh, right? Yeah. Because if you get, um, when I think, uh, I lived in Minnesota, and I immediately think of, like, the cheese heads, yeah. which is kind of ridiculous. Right, that you will go well, you put on the screen, the you'll wear like a wedge of cheese <laughs> on your head, and that's supposed to make you feel powerful, and that your team can win. Yeah. But with these other ones, by appropriating a, a culture that was very strong, that was fearsome, mm -hmm. that was that had all of these qualities of, of truly making white frontiersmen and women afraid, mm -hmm. the idea of appropriating these images, which allow you to scream the way a haka might or that allow you to have these performative actions that make you feel like you're a part of the, the team, I think that reflects something about their identity as well. Oh, most certainly. I mean, yeah. Deloria has a great book called Plain Indian that speaks exactly to this. There's a number of scholars that uh, speak to that very issue. The, the, uh, the Florida Seminoles, you know, have the, um, I can't remember the mascot name, and uh, in the Illini have players that ride, they have uh, uh, people in dress right out for the game, and uh, uh, I mean, there's elaborate acts, the, the Atlanta Braves, the Tomahawk Chop, all that sort of stuff. I mean, yeah, there is an elaborate um, 
cultural rituals that are related to these mascots as well that again point to the problem right it's not it's not simply the term but that term is what draws our attention to these sorts of values and really if naming is one of the most powerful framing acts is what justifies a lot of this sort of behavior right I mean I think absent the name and a real interrogation into the reasons why these names are used and things like that, that it's just not appropriate to do a tomahawk chop anymore. I mean, it might still happen, as I argue, because there's, there's deeper sentiment and, and, and attachment to those, uh, you know, that are very difficult to, to challenge, uh, you know, but, you know, all of these scholars, and my argument is, like, that they, they come together and become justified at that name. And that's why they're so strongly fought for and defended. I disagree with what you were saying that, that. I remember there was a, a period where we had the Wild West show, mm -hmm. where people did the rodeos, they did the whole thing, and it was sort of taking on sort of the national identity. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if in a way that this is reoccurring in a way that these are Wild West shows put in modern garb. Yeah. They're just refaced for another period. Yeah. And that the only awesome. way the only way people feel whatever it is of our national identity, one way would be to take those historical tropes mm -hmm. and repackage them. Oh, certainly, certainly. No, that's that is a, a large part of it. I mean, you know, the uh, uh, you know, in this instance with the Redskins, we're talking a lot about how the uh, how the uh, sort of the revolutionary youth appropriation of. Native Americans then become the Boston Braves, then become the Redskins, distinguish them. Um, you know, but the entire use of the of the West and the relationship between frontiermen and uh, and interactions with Native Americans, uh, you know, is an elaborate sort of staging and, and colonial behavior. That uh, certainly, yeah, it's today's NFL is a you know is a um, uh, you know there's other instances where that plays out, most certainly. I mean, as I said, it's a core part of American identity in many ways, whether we acknowledge it as well as we should, you know, and so that's why it's so pervasive, you know, it's just we don't often think about, about it, and especially as so many cultures, or as so many cultural practices or traditions have been absorbed into Euro-American culture, you know, that we just don't think a lot about it. You, know? uh, you mentioned Michael Wilbon earlier. And I yeah. Think John Stewart and Daily Show did a yeah. nice piece on yeah. um, I think generally, ever since the patent was kind of in reverse, uh, I've, I've been watching, because I watch the NFL a lot, to see you know, how will media react, mm -hmm. and yet continually TV announcers will say, turn Redskins during a broadcast. Sure, sure. Even though I think, I don't know, there, there seems to be a lot of power within the media here, especially looking at the deal the NFL just signed for Thursday Night Football, how much money they'll make there. Oh, yes. My question for you, is there is there any backlash or response from major media outlets like ESPN or NBC to say, we're not going to use this term anymore, we're going to just say Washington, or is this yeah. just, no, like they're perpetuating the narrative and they could have a huge impact on I mean, that's, that is happening, right? I mean, the, I think ESPN's policy is it's up to the individual announcers, and so they'll often say things like the team from Wa the NFL team from Washington, mm -hmm. uh, and Will Bond. Uh, there's I'm trying to remember which paper came out against it. I don't think it's the Post. Maybe it is. I think it was the Post. Yeah, maybe it is the Post. We'll not use it in the paper anymore. So you're seeing instances of it, and they're significant. You know, like I said, that and Will Bond's just one of many people that pointed out. Uh, that really came out pretty strongly on it. But here's the problem, right? If I say the team from Washington and have this image, I mean, it's still there, right? I mean, it's not like we don't know what they're talking about. But I think that's important. But really, it's a, as one um, a sociologist um, by the name of, uh, of King has an interesting piece. In 2014, they had a conference at the, uh, the, um, the uh, National, or the, the, yeah, the, I'm blanking on the name of the museum, the National uh, Museum of the Native American, that's their name of it, American Indian, thank you. Um, they had a nice conference there where they invited a bunch of people to come to speak, and, uh, and his comments after that, that conference was that 
uh, there's a convergence of interest that there is the media of when we try to hold people responsible there's the media the NFL obviously and the ownership but there's also the media and then there's the fans and so media is coming along fans there's probably some things happening at but I mean unless you kind of begin cracking into the third triad you know that the problem will continue um, you know, and it's and there's at the bottom line a gigantic financial incentive, in some sense. But there's also good arguments that changing mascots is really profitable. I mean, you now have an entire market to sell new stuff. Everybody's got to buy new things. Uh, you know, but uh, but that doesn't really resolve a lot of like I say the attachment and the and the sort of like memory of it. Uh, but no, the media has been you know rather interesting in sort of how they, they're trying to deal with it. You know, it's not often that sports media become political, especially ESPN, that one stunned me. I did not expect, I did not see that one coming. So. Any other questions or comments? Uh, yes, I just wonder, have you detected any strain that's related to the um, My Life Matters for the people who are offended by the mascots? Because I was looking at your image here where uh, it looks like a Native American woman and mm -hmm. she says, not a mascot. Mm -hmm. So if not a mascot, what are you? Yeah. And, and it's like, and, and I think this goes back to the question about the Celtics, or mm -hmm. the Celtics, yeah. whatever you call them, <laughs> Celtics. the Hoosiers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I think people who feel that they're part of those groups still feel that as a human being, they're of equal value mm -hmm. to the mainstream America. Whereas people who have a problem with the mascot issue feel that discounted life. You know, it, it's yeah. not quite of equal value. And so in a way, this is standing up to say, you know, see me, I'm not invisible. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I mean, that's the fight. Right? That's the really the struggle, right? I mean, there is, a substantial amount of protest going on about this. You know, I don't want to undercut that by any means, but like I say, the problem often is it's so it's so removed from the game that the frame in which we discuss these issues doesn't have an easy time registering those. Like even ESPN's action is just a straight change of the word. Like they don't really go into the history. I mean, they've done. Um, some documentaries and things like that where some of these issues are talked about but when you hear the team from Washington if you're not aware of sort of the background or why the change happened you're just like oh isn't that peculiar you know or um, uh, you know so yeah certainly I mean the uh, you know and then the, 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 the effect of these mascots do register amongst a number of people like even I said people that will support the mascot are not saying this isn't shameful and, and hurtful they're just saying there's other other issues that we think are a tad bit more important, or that the pain of complete assimilation and cultural erasure is worse than the pain that we're currently experiencing. So, but you don't hear that amongst, like I say, the Hoosier community or the Celtic community. Um, you know, and, and again, it's about the nature of, uh, of hegemony in this country. So, but no, that's certainly a very good point. Because, you know, um, Kelly, when you, you've asked for feedback, and in, in, the, in the audiences to which you present this paper, some people might see uh, an imbalance. You okay. Know, the paper has to do with the N word, and you, you started with the image of, um, of black men holding up their arms. Um, in a very wrenching kind of situation. Mm -hmm. But yet you end up saying that while they're doing that, they, they are themselves implicitly being racist mm -hmm. in the sense that they are projecting, you know. Uh, so. And in, the, in your paper, you do very little with that part of the story. Uh, so when you get Somebody might a ask you, why not have a paper which says that you have a uh, heterogeneous set of mascots mm -hmm. and you're picking one set of mascots which exhibit racism mm -hmm. and you're and why, why why not the contrast between mascots how does 
the N word fit comfortably within this uh, within this this rhetorical structure? Some people might ask. Yeah, sure. Uh, honestly, that was a debate. Some uh, I should acknowledge, which I did on earlier. So they'll they will uh, curse my name somewhat. It's like I have two graduate students that have worked with me on this: Avery Henry and John Koch, who have done a lot of. We did a lot of brainstorming sessions about part of this, and we have. I think for Atlanta, we still have this part of this presentation, this thing will become Frankenstein-like at, at a certain point, but that deals a lot with the debate about uh, the attempt to regulate the N-word, which I don't talk about here other than to say, isn't it interesting that in 2013-14, there is this overwhelming interest to regulate language in this one instance, but almost the virtually no interest in dealing with the same language. So the the end of the paper is really what draws it together, which is the NFL has this, this conflicting view on how language and appropriation operates. Why is that? Right? So maybe that should be foregrounded much more. Because the, the, the N-word part of the debate is just, they act swiftly. I mean, it's, it, it's almost as if, yeah, we acknowledge it, this is a problem. Uh, there are players uh, present. So we're aware of them. There are former players that are upset about this that are present. Uh, we need to act. And we understand language to operate this way. Whereas the mascot issue is right there at the same time, being publicly discussed, protested, should have had the exact same sort of attention by the NFL. Congress was knocking at the door. President Obama spoke about it. And Goodell comes out and says, no, no, in this instance, it's great. It's great. Can't possibly take it away. You know, so there is a... There is another side to this paper that desperately needs its own article that I'm not sure what to do with that relates more with the sort of the generational issues that we spoke about and the attitude towards the name. And then the NFL's desire to rein in effect, uh, the affect of their players, the emotions of their players, um, and the whole debate about Richard Sherman and his behavior after the Super Bowl a couple of years ago uh, really kind of drew attention to this. But like I say, maybe that'll be my next brown bag. Uh, but you know, it's something that we've been really thinking about. And, and you're right, there is this imbalance in it um, that I would like to, I think that's where I'm gonna go fix it for the presentation is to make it a little tighter as to why I'm looking at these two issues together. Because analytically, it makes it a sort of a challenge somewhat, too, because they're completely different debates, but they constitute a similar frame. You know? Yeah? I have a question about when you're saying that the, these two words are being used the same. Uh, there's, there's some semantic difference in regular, well, in the, the usage of the N word by people who use that not as a derogatory term in yeah. the dialect. Yeah. And with the R word, I don't know that. Maybe I'm not familiar with the issues um, for those people, yeah. but I'm not I'm not familiar with any cases of that being used as a term of endearment, affection, and camaraderie in yeah. the same way that semantically the N word is used. Um, so I don't know. Maybe you can speak to the, the relationship of when you're talking about them being used the same. I, I see the, the derogatory aspect of both, um, yeah. but not the affectionate. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. The, I didn't articulate very clearly, but earlier we were talking about there's a generational divide. Older players from the Polar Alliance uh, are very much against the use of the word, consider it derogatory in every instance. Younger players have really rebelled against it. Richard Sherman came out very publicly to say, no, 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 it's a term of endearment amongst players. You misunderstand. Like, and then there's an entire theory that draws differences between the use of the terms. Interesting enough, though, there is mascot theory that I don't talk about here, or not mascot theory, but there are people, like Native American communities, like that have uh, strong hockey presence in their communities that wear red hawk jerseys, or black hawk jerseys, for instance. They consider it a source of pride. And so there are instances of reappropriation of their own representation back. But are they using it in, in discourse among themselves as in the same way? No, not in the same way. No, no, not, but not in any way. What, the similarity that I speak of in this presentation is more about how does the NFL theorize appropriation of language. Yeah, where they view them contra in a contradictory fashion, regardless of the reality of how it's used within communities or by individuals. Yeah, there it, it's absolutely true that there's a difference. I, I just, this occurred to me one other thing. Okay. We're talking was 
the, one of the things that that picture brings up, mm -hmm. which is just so obvious, is the role of the athlete mm -hmm. in the society. Because why why are we surrounded with this with athletics? Why is that? Well, I mean, the rodeo was an athletic performance, but then it was also a kind of a well, the, the, the phrase "dog and pony show" sure. and all that Very sort theatrical. of thing. Yeah. Are we? Uh, are, 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 is sports so reflective of our culture that athletes speak, or not the, uh, for other things, other symbolic things are going on, but the other thing that occurred to me was our arguments over the flag, mm -hmm. over not only just the southern flag, but, but even the, the regular flag. Mm -hmm. Symbolic politics is what I'm thinking about, because this tends to. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the the importance of the athlete, um, you know, as a reflective of society, but also as a political figure is an interesting one. You know, that we are always very upset that Michael Jordan has never come out to speak about race issues. Uh, that a lot of people with the Redskin mascot have wondered why um, the, uh, the team's quarterback, who is black, has not come out to make public statements about the issue. Uh, and so, yeah, we really have kind of high expectations, I think, for the the political force of athletes that they're either uncomfortable taking or it's why are we putting them in that place in the first place, you know. Uh, so that may be paper three, but that's a good <laughs> suggestion. I really appreciate it. So thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it.